Okay, let's get back on track here. This evening we're gonna ha- we have Brother Don uh, Woodard with us, pastor and evangelist and founder of Light to Haiti Ministries and Orphanage. So he'll be speaking this evening. Then October fifth we have a ladies' lunch. They're gonna meet at the church at ten thirty and be going to the Topeka Pizza. If anyone wants to go to the Michiana Event Center to a craft fair after that, the cost is five dollars, and you can see Clara Bell Miller about that one. Then October 7th, we'll have Bible quizzing at Faith Baptist over in Angola. So those are the announcements that are coming up. Then in um, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses um, 9 and 10, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, to us toward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. You know, the Lord is not slack in his promises. He does not give them up. He does not change them. He does not alter them. Just remember that when somebody says, well, everybody's told me the Lord's coming back. Well, you know, he's going to come back. It might not be tomorrow, but it'll happen. You can count on it because everything that God said in the Bible and prophecy has happened except for, I believe it's the rapture. So um, just remember that. So if you stand with me uh, for an opening word of prayer and remain standing for prayer, I'm going to ask Brother Carter if he'll open us in prayer, please. Amen. Take your hymnals. We'll start out with number 434. 434, He Keeps Me Singing. Hope you have a song in your heart tonight. 434. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still in all of thy seven and flow. Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name I know. Fills me with joy. <laughs> Keeps me singing as I go. All my life is wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go, feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath the sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing. Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name I know. Sing every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry skies. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown, I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Good singing. You may be seated. 443. 
443, under his wings I am safely abiding. 443. <clears throat> under his wings I am safely abiding. Though the night deepens and tempests are wild, still I can trust him. I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me and I am his child. Under Four hundred sixty-one. Anyone have a praise or a testimony tonight? Four hundred sixty-one. Miss Mary. Amen. Mary has. Uh, Amen. Mary had surgery this week. So, hey, brother Joseph. Turn void. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, Carter. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's always a good testimony. Nathan.
understand us? Amen. October 1st, and it feels like summer. Not bad. Amen. All right, 461. 461, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. 461. Oh, 
three years, and so it uh, wasn't really going to work out. So um, I said, well, next time you're in, you're in the vicinity, give me a call. We'll, uh, we'll have you come over and present your ministry as well as um, preach for us. So Brother Woodard, you come, and uh, the Lord bless you as you bring your word tonight. I like that you plan ahead like that. I think that's good. Oh, yes, I'll get that turned over to Kevin. This one, right? Yep. Okay. Here we go. Okay. I like that uh, the preacher plans ahead like that. I tell you, y'all have some good singing here. I enjoyed the congregational singing, and y'all sing out like you're glad you're saved. Amen. Amen. Uh, I like that. We ought to be glad about it. Amen. But um, I got to tell you, uh, um, I, I appreciate... Carter, I know he's here, and I don't, I don't want to embarrass him, and I don't want to give him a big head either, but uh, uh, we, we have been in Haiti for 23 years, and I won't get into all that tonight, but it's kind of a long story, but uh, it's not anything I ever planned. I never planned to be in Haiti. I just It just kind of happened, and the Lord opened doors and, and continued to open doors, so uh, we, we help a national pastor there by the name of Obed Supreme. And uh, he, we now have uh, over 60 children that we take care of, plus a lot of other children that we feed every day, about 80 total, uh, 60 that we're very responsible for, you might say. And uh, some, uh, the others would be like in care of their grandparents in different situations and the poverty so bad. If we didn't feed them every day, they wouldn't eat every day. And so we help them in that way. We're getting ready in November and this is this week, uh, uh, Brother Carter and I and his dad will be talking a lot about some things we're working on. But <clears throat> we're going to be shipping, uh, probably the week before Thanksgiving, Christmas gifts for 80 children. I've got a guy giving us six bicycles. He, this guy I met this last week has a ministry called Bicycles from Heaven. And uh, he's a Christian man, and he fixes up bicycles people throw away, and he gives them to kids that need bicycles. And so he told me, I said, I told him about that, what we were doing in Haiti. And I said, I'm, I'd like to send six bicycles to Haiti. He said, I got you taken care of. He said, don't worry about it. When do you want me to deliver them? I said, well, I like this guy. So uh, we're sending bicycles. We're sending Christmas gifts. We're sending over 10,000 New Testaments in the Creole language. And, and Carter, we tell you, that's big. They do not have Bibles. The pastors don't have Bibles. We just ordered and we're trying to get this worked out. There seems to be a mix-up with a computer. I do not like computer problems. But we have 30 whole Bibles, study Bibles, kind of like a Thompson chain or Schofield, but in Creole. 30 that we're shipping to Haiti uh, soon uh, for pastors. The pastors don't even have whole Bibles, a lot of them. One pastor that Brother Carter and I met... Uh, all he had to use to lead his people with was a children's Bible. And it wasn't even a complete Bible. Can you imagine? So we're excited about that. Plus sending rice, beans, oil, uh, and flour. So it's going to be a big truckload of stuff. It's going to be put on a boat and go to Haiti. Okay? So just pray for us about all that. We're working on organizing that. And uh, the door, the, the, it's just wide open there. The Lord's blessing. And for a long time... I've been praying the Lord would send us somebody because I'm getting a little bit older. I told the men in the prayer room it takes me a little longer to get up now than it used to. Okay, I think my get up done got up and left me. But anyway, um, we uh, we're, we're I prayed the Lord send us somebody that, a, a younger guy that could help me. And last year at Brother Carter's church, he came up to me. I made that announcement that we were praying for that. And Carter said, I, I'd like to talk to you about that. And he went to Haiti with me, as you might know, back in July. We had a great time. I got real sick, and he filled in and helped and did some things that I was not able to do. And so I appreciate him. We, and we do ask. We, I thank you for your help in, in supporting uh, Carter. And uh, uh, just pray for us, the Lord's blessing. And just other, by other way of information, uh, my wife Debbie is with me. And uh, we've been married for 43 consecutive years. And... Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, <clears throat> I'm happily married, and sometimes people say, well, how do you know that you're happily married? And my answer is quite simple. She sat me down one day, and she told me, you're happy. <laughs> and uh, so <clears throat> I've been happy ever since. But anyway, 
But uh, we're, we're very blessed. The Lord has given us five wonderful children we're very proud of. We have uh, 12 grandchildren. We have 11 here, one in heaven, and God's good. And so we're very grateful. Uh, this past July, I celebrated 38 years in the ministry, and the Lord's been good to us. Uh, we uh, traveled for 15 years all over the United States, worked a lot with young people, went to juvenile prisons, and God blessed us in revival work. And this coming July, uh, I've been for 15 years now, I've been pastoring. And so this coming July, after 15 and a half years, I will be stepping out and retiring or refiring. I like to use the word refiring. And uh, stepping out of pastoring, and I want to do revival work again and do more in Haiti. Haiti takes about, tw- uh, anymore it's taking about 20 hours a week of my time. So I'm almost full time in that anyway. So anyway, just pray for us. And uh, I appreciate you, and I appreciate your pastor and his enthusiasm, and appreciate y'all putting up with me tonight. So I want to share something with you <clears throat> that I trust will be a help. By the way, I didn't even bring my books up here. Left them in the seat. Got some books back there. I'll just tell you about it. Well, Brother Carter, will you grab them? And I, I don't mean to do I don't like commercials, so I'll make this quick, okay? And um, especially if I'm watching a cowboy movie, I'll just soon not have a commercial. All right. Okay. A couple of books. This book's been out for a while. It's called When the Will of God is a Bitter Cup. And it's uh, the subtitle is Healing for the Brokenhearted. And if you have, if you know someone that's been through a heartache, uh, the, the death of a loved one, or uh, just has, has had, a tra- had trauma in their life, uh, this book, uh, you, they, they would find it helpful. Okay, This book came out this year. This is a self-published book. And it's called Seven Voices in Your Life. And I, I got this thought to preach through this, and I took seven weeks. I think I actually did six. I think one Sunday I preached on a Sunday morning and Sunday night. But you have seven voices in your life, okay? And I told my church up front when we started this series, I said, this is going to be a book. And I dedicated the book to them. But uh, I, I'll try to remember quickly. I'm a little tired today. We drove here yesterday, and it's been a long day, and yesterday was long. And so I'm, I'm, my energy level is not what I would like it to be. And so anyway, uh, the seven voices in your life are, uh, number one, the voice of your past. Secondly, it's the voice of your present, the voice of your future, the voice of your conscience, the voice of Satan, the voice of God, and you are a voice. And the two, when I went through at our church, the two messages that seemed to get the most interest and people seemed to get the most out of was the voice of your past or voices of your past and the voice of your conscience. Your conscience, which will bring me my other book, but your, the word conscience means with knowledge. And so your conscience is what you have. Everybody has a conscience and your conscience is I'll say, I use this word, programmed from your youth. You're taught what's right and wrong. And some people will say, well, that that person doesn't seem to have a conscience. Well, they do have a conscience, but their conscience was never given truth. And um, so anyway, that was quite, uh, it, I like this book. I, I, I think it helps people. And uh, this is my brand new book. It's called Training a Child's Conscience. I got the idea for this when I wrote this this, okay? And I already had a lot of material on this. I went ahead and put some other things together. <clears throat> but the subtitle of this is The Battle for Our Children's Soul. Okay, listen carefully. They are not coming after your child's gender. They're coming after their soul. That's right. yep. Absolutely. And they're programming, and I wish I had time on this, but they're programming their consciences on what is not right. And they're doing it gradually. They do it through movies. They do it through the internet. And I'll just go ahead and say this and I'll feel better. Nobody under the age of 18 needs a cell phone. Thank you, preacher, for helping us. Amen. Uh, they don't need access to all this stuff that's coming across that thing and all this social media stuff because they're being programmed. Television programs are programming them that this, this lifestyle, this way of living is acceptable and it's okay. They make heroes out of these people. Hello. And our children are buying into that. And they're being told this in the schoolhouse. They're being told it in movies and 
uh, social media. And so a chapter that I think in this, uh, a, a lesson, I call them lessons, not chapters, is this thought. The enemy gets it, okay? And what I talk about in that chapter, the enemy gets it, is that the enemy understands the principle of train up a child. Think about that a minute. They understand the principle of train up a child. Then I talk about in here what a child's conscience is. I talk about what it means to bring up a child. Paul said, bring up a child in the, and your fathers provoke not your children in wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I talk about what that means to bring them up. A lot of times we hear preaching on that text, the emphasis is put on the, the nurture and admonition, and that part is important, but that, that statement, bring them up, is important. So anyway, uh, those are back there on the table, and I'll be back there afterward. A couple other things back there. If you have any questions, just see me. I'll be back there and uh, do my best, all right? Okay, Genesis, if you would, Genesis chapter 3 tonight. Where's the lady whose son, let me put my glasses on, whose son lives in Tennessee? That was you? We're, I, I'm originally from the promised land of Tennessee. Um, uh, I was born just outside of Nashville. Well, I was born in Nashville, but our people are from just north of there. Where does he live? Does he? Okay, okay. Yeah, that's only about four, a little over four hours, or about four hours from where we live in Virginia. Okay, all right, good deal. Well, that's a nice place there. Knoxville's nice. Okay, that's close to uh, uh, Sevierville and the Smokies and all that, not real far from there. We like it there. All right, Genesis chapter 3. Did I tell you that part? We're going to read beginning at verse 20. We're going to read down to chapter 4 in verse 2, and then we'll make our prayer. And then I want to share a thought with you. Now, Pastor, what time do we normally get out on Sunday night? Normally seven. Okay. We, we'll, we should be around, around seven. So around, like around seven is somewhere around eight. But anyway, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. If you found Genesis chapter three, if you would, please, out of respect to the word of God, if you're able, will you stand with me, please? <clears throat> Verse 20, we begin there. It says, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, uh, said Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now let's make our prayer, Lord. We thank you for this good church. I ask tonight, Father, that you'd give me clarity of thought. Lord, I do believe in my heart that the truth that we have in your word tonight will help us in our relationships. And I pray you'd show that to us. I pray, Lord, that the need of each one here would be met. And then as best I can, I yield to your spirit, my thoughts, my heart, my, my soul. I pray, Lord, that you just be glorified in what we do. I pray, give me strength. And Lord, this is a, a wonderful place to be. It's a place of honor to be in a pulpit. But I do not want to be here by myself. So I do pray for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated if you would. Um, about, I was telling one of the men earlier, about 2016, I started studying the topic of relationships in the Bible. And what happened is I was at a youth conference. I had taken our teenagers from our church to, and a man said something that just really got my attention. And so uh, I went, I went, I told, I went home, I told Debbie, I said, I really want to study this. Now I'd studied relationships in the Bible before, but I began to really study carefully about relationships. I came to the conclusion that life is about relationships. God created us for the purpose of having a relationship with him. God put other people in our life so that we could have relationships. Now, 
Uh, if you think about this, I say this a lot to people. Uh, if you look at your life and if you look at all the blessings you have in life, most of your blessings in life are connected to a person, to a relationship. If you look at the challenges you have in life, uh, most of the challenges you have are connected to a person, to a relationship. Now, I've worked with all kinds of people. I've done a lot of work in uh, what we would call, now I'm careful about using this term anymore, but um, I think it's been abused, uh, uh, counseling. I prefer the word discipling, okay? Uh, so I've discipled a lot of people who what I call come from a dark place or from a hard place. Uh, people, I've counseled scores of people who have been abused for, as children in the worst kinds of ways. And their challenges are connected to a person who committed an evil act against them. Okay? So does that make sense? So if you look at life, most of your blessings are connected to a person. Most of your challenges in life are connected to to a person or to a relationship. And I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to study on this a little bit more. I think that revival is about a relationship. Can I say it this way? Boy, I'm working on this, and when it's my turn, I'm going to preach on this, okay? Revival's about a person. Think about that a minute. Revival is about Him. Amen. Anyway, uh, I want to share something with United Truth. I think it'll be helpful to you. And I want to encourage you to write a few things on your heart. First of all, someone wisely said, made this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this statement, and I, I don't know who originated this. I'm just going to tell you, but the guy I got it from said he didn't know where it came from. But I encourage you to write this on your heart. You can only live life forward and understand it backwards. Now, that's a great truth. You can only live life forward and understand it backward. Now, the Apostle Paul said, Forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul was living forward. He was pressing on. He had goals in his life. However, if you read all of Paul's letters, you find that he also understood life backwards. He talked about having a thorn in the flesh, which I, well, I think this. I think we don't know what it is because God didn't tell us what his thorn was. I lean toward this because he made the statement, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Uh, and I talk about this in the book on the seven voices that I think that his, his uh, thorn in the flesh, <clears throat> the messenger of Satan, was the voices of his past. We know the first time he preached, they, they objected. They rejected him. They said, this is the guy that was persecuting us. Why are we listening to him? And some of them walked out. So he had these messengers. A messenger, by the way, the word angel means messenger. A messenger doesn't have necessarily, is not necessarily an angel as far as a heavenly being, we might say. A messenger can be a person. Messenger of Satan can be a person. Someone that's reminding you of something from your past, reminding you of, of something that you regret. So anyway, uh, uh, Paul understood the idea of looking back and <coughs> learning, <coughs> if you will, <coughs> learning about life from looking back but he also knew that he had to press forward. He had to look to the future. So I want to speak to you on the thought of live forward. And I want us to uh, kind of under that statement, let me say this, under that statement, live forward, there's a lot of ground we could cover. There's a lot of directions to go with that. But I want to focus on this thought. Live forward in your relationships. And can I add to that, uh, the future of your relationships. Now, we all have relationship issues. All of us do. There are no perfect families. There are no perfect marriages. When I was a boy, uh, we, I, when I was 11 years old, I went to, some of you might be familiar with this ministry, I went to the Bill Rice Ranch. Now, I'm what they call a bus kid. I grew up in what they is sometimes referred to as a dysfunctional family. We had, we had issues at, at my house, okay? We had a lot. 
I'm the oldest of my dad's third family. My dad was a drunk for a long, long time. He was over 40 years old when I was born. And uh, 40 years ago yesterday, he died on the 30th of September. So uh, I went to the Bill Rice Ranch, and I thought, I loved Bill Rice. This is the old cowboy evangelist that started the Bill Rice Ranch. I was 11 years old. He's still living. I thought, boy, this is the greatest thing in the world. I liked Bill Rice. He, he was an evangelist. He was a preacher. He had a ranch. He was a cowboy. He drove a big white car, and I thought, that's from, he had big, remember, the, remember when they made a car? You remember these 1973 Mercury Grand Marquis? You remember those? You needed a football field to turn that boy, bad boy around. Uh, that was an automobile there. He always drove those big Mercury's like that. And I thought, boy, this is, if I could just live here at the Bill Rice Ranch, and if Bill Rice could be my dad and that could be my family, my life would be perfect. Well, I love the Rices. Will Rice, the grandson of Dr. Bill Rice, is my friend. I just saw him last month. I found out their family wasn't perfect either. There are no perfect families. There are no perfect marriages. There's no perfect. And I tell people that my children are not perfect because their dad is not. And everything good about them is because of the grace of God and because they have a good mother. Amen. But there's no perfect relationships. All relationships have issues and challenges. And we kind of have hiccups sometimes. And throughout the Bible, we find that people in the Bible had challenges in their relationships. As a matter of fact, we could say that Adam and Eve had some problems or challenges in their relationships. And we know that Adam and Eve had relationship challenges in their relationship with each other, and they caused a relationship problem in their relationship with God because they disobeyed Him. And their disobedience to God caused a relationship problem between them. So tonight, for the next few moments, we're going to kind of draw from Adam and Eve's relationships, okay? Or, uh, and we're going to kind of take a look at some of the challenges they had. Now, we know the history of Adam and Eve. We know that, that uh, uh, they lived in a perfect world. God created the world. It was perfect. Every, they had everything they needed. I mean, imagine, I don't think we can, but try to imagine the beautiful, perfect splendor of creation before sin. Imagine how beautiful the garden would have been. Imagine the idea that the roses had no thorns. I mean, a Garden of Eden was everything that these crazy people, tree-hugging people want. It was perfect. The perfect environment. There were no thorns on the roses. Everything was wonderful. Think about what the world would have been like or the Garden of Eden would have been like when, with the, the absence of sin and sorrow. Imagine that environment, if you will. How pure the environment would have been. I mean emotionally, if I can say it that way. Emotionally pure the environment would have been. And then, of course, physically, when they, they worked, they didn't perspire. Everything was perfect. It was paradise. But then the enemy got in. The enemy entered in or trespassed. Lucifer trespassed and entered into paradise. And he enticed and influenced Eve to eat from the forbidden tree. And then we know the history that eating from the forbidden tree was a rebellion and a trespass against what God had told Adam and Eve. Now, when, he, when she partook of what God told her she was not to partake of, and she gave also to Adam, and the Bible says, and he did eat, that caused a breach in their relationship with God. And, uh, uh, of course, in that very thought, there's a lot of lessons for us and how God dealt with them. There's a lot of lessons in how he dealt with them about salvation, about a sin sacrifice, about redemption, and about restoration. There's valuable lessons in all of that for us. And there's valuable lessons for us in Adam and Eve's relationship and how it was restored. Now, uh, let me insert this real quick. This lesson is not about marriage only, although married couples can benefit 
from what we're looking at tonight. But there's a, there's a lot in this for our relationship with God. There's a lot in this lesson I'm going to share with you tonight from the Bible in our relationship with our children, with our parents, and in our, uh, among our family members. And of course, can I also add, this will help us in our relationships even within the church. Now, Adam and Eve's actions, we know, caused a problem in their relationship with each other. We don't really read into that a lot. We don't think about that a lot. But can you, we're going to see that in a minute. Can you imagine the stress that would have came between them when they sinned against God? I want you to notice this part with me. Look at chapter 3 and notice the beginning at verse 8. Let's go read this real quick down to verse 12. It says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now, can I say, based on what Adam's response was, there was a problem, <laughs> okay? They had a, they had a, a, a friction. They had a, a challenge in their relationship. There was a problem, I'll say it that way, in their marriage. Notice Adam's response when God asked Adam, Hast thou eaten of the tree? Now, Adam takes, he takes a little bit of responsibility, just a little bit. He said, yes, I, I did eat. But he said, now, wait a minute, though, Lord. I ate of the tree, but wait a minute. Uh, he places the blame on God and Eve. He said, it's the woman. And not only is it the woman, but it's the woman you gave me. You gave her to me. And she enticed me, and she gave me of the tree, and I did eat, but it's the woman. That's the problem. Now, I want us to think about that a minute. How often do we blame our relationship behaviors on someone else? And I, it took me a long time to figure this out. I, I teach this a little bit about the idea of we have what I call early life role models. We have, in life, we have models and mentors. In your early life, you had role models. You, you don't get to choose them, usually, but you choose your mentors. Now, I mean, be unkind, just bear with me. When I was a boy, I thought every man screamed and hollered and cussed at his wife and threatened to kill her. I thought every man beat his wife. I thought every man choked his wife. I thought every man, if his wife, and they got in a fight, he would just drag her out in the backyard and beat her and throw her down on the ground. Are y'all okay? Are we okay? That's, now I never hit my wife because she has a gun and I'm afraid of her. <laughs> 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 Biggest mistake I ever made, I bought her a gun for Christmas. What was I thinking? Anyway. But I had, a, I had a role model that that's what I saw. Now, now, let me help you young people. Don't miss this. I figured out that we also can choose mentors. One day, and I'll, I'm not being critical. Please understand, I love my dad. I miss my dad. But I figured out one day that I had people in my life telling me that I, that I was never going to make it, and I'd never be anything, and never amount to anything, and nobody would ever want me. And I heard all that. And I had people over here saying, you know what? Well, you have potential. And I remember telling me, God's hands on you as a boy. And it finally dawned on me, I had to look at the life of the people over here that were telling me I couldn't. And look at the life of the people over here telling me I could. You know what I saw? The lives of the people over here were defeated. They were miserable. They had no joy. They had no victory. They didn't even like themselves. But the people over here, they had good marriages. They had good relationships. 
They were, they were a benefit to society, if I can say it that way. They were living a victorious life. They were, be, they were doing something productive in life. So I had to decide that I'm going to get my mentors from over here. I'm going to learn from these folks over here. But anyway, we can't blame, at a point in our life, we can't blame our behaviors on everybody else and what we saw in everybody else. Can often also, also show you this, how often we sh- do we shift the blame of our relationship issues to someone else? That's what Adam was doing. See, Adam was guilty. The point is, he was guilty. He ate of what he knew he wasn't supposed to eat of. So blaming somebody else for that wasn't sufficient. You know, here's a thought for us. Adam was in part responsible, and Eve was in part responsible for the breach. They were both responsible, but watch watch this. It was God that took the responsibility of reaching out to restore and reconcile. I'm going to back that up. He reached out to reconcile and restore them. It was the one that was sinned against that reached out to make things better. And now can I show you this? Adam's attitude was a problem. I once again, I mentioned a moment ago that think of all that they lost. They, it was a, they, were, they, were in a, they had a perfect life together, living in paradise. They had a pure relationship. Everything was wonderful. And then because they listened to the enemy, it was all gone. They lost all that. And then, if you think about, you know, think about humanly speaking, what they would have gone through after that happened, even after they were restored, the struggle that they had, because they knew it wasn't going to be like it was. Can I suggest that they would have had some guilt and anxiety and some tension and maybe anger and fear? We know they had conviction. And all those things entered into their hearts. Here's a thought for us. When one person's under conviction, those that are closest to that person are affected by the guilt of the conviction. Now, when you think about their situation, Adam and Eve, they messed up. They're going to be put out of the garden. We're going to see that in a minute. They disobeyed God. There's a problem there. So even after that restoration takes place, they've still got some things they've got to deal with. Their life is different now. Now, can I say to us that a lot of us can relate to the situation that Adam and Eve found themselves in? Kind of the aftermath of something that happens. Maybe it's the aftermath of trauma. Word, our modern word trauma in the Bible is wounded spirit. Something devastating has happened. Or, or one person messed up really bad one person messed up so what do we do again some of us can relate to this now i want to give you some truths from the word of god that will help us with the future of our relationships and before we get into those real quick can i repeat our quote from earlier you can only live life forward and understand it back Only live life forward and understand it backwards. Here's our first thought. Everything was made right between between Adam and Eve and God. See, God reached out to them or reached down to them, we might say, to make it right. And they were reconciled. Everything was restored. And when, when reconciliation takes place and restoration takes place, that's when everything begins. You know, think about this for a minute. When you got saved, when you came to Christ, received Christ as your Savior, your relationship with God did not end there. It began there. That began the future of your relationships. See, too often we think that when something goes wrong in our relationship, and maybe it could be a real bad thing, that it's all over. Well, when we seek forgiveness and we seek restoration and we seek reconciliation, 
the relationship still has a future. Does this make sense? Your relationship, see, getting saved didn't end anything. It began everything. Think about this example, if I could put this in here real quick. When the prodigal son came home, first he came to himself. He had a repentant heart. He confessed his sin. He, he rehearsed what he was going to confess to his father all the way home. When he went home with a repentant heart and confession, did that end his relationship with his father? No. The relationship, don't miss this, the relationship had a future. It had a future. Years ago, I was in a missions conference, my wife and I, way back, and there was a missionary there, and we was, having, we was doing what we all do when the church folks get together, we eat. <laughs> and so we were eating, and they had a big meal for the missionaries, a bunch of people in the church, and so we was talking to this missionary, my wife and I, and he was married, but his wife was not with him. We got to talking, and, and he said, uh, so we, we was kind of going through the line together, we thought we'd sit down together and sit down and eat together, so in conversation, I asked him, I said, well, how many children do you have? And I forget the number, but he said, I think he said, well, we used to have five, and now we got four. I said, oh, my. I said, I'm, I'm sorry. I said, what happened? Did you had a child that died? He said, no. He said, we have one we disowned. I said, excuse me? He said, we have a daughter that got 18 and decided she's going to wear makeup. And she's going to live ways we didn't think was right. I said, well, son, if the barn needs paint, paint it. <laughs> That's mine. He said, well, we've disowned her. She's not our daughter anymore. I couldn't take a whole lot more of that. I said, you know what? I said, I'm glad you're not God. I said, I'm going to go over there and sit. I'm going to tell you something else. I said, so you see that man over there, the pastor? I said, That's my pastor. I said, I'm a member of this church. I said, you might as well leave now because you ain't going to get a dime out of here when I get done. <laughs> What's wrong with us? That shouldn't have ended. We should pray. We, maybe, maybe the young lady was doing things that were not right, but that didn't mean she wasn't his daughter anymore. Mine, I've, told, I've said before, mine might mess up real bad. They're still going to be mine. See, the future, our relationships can have a future. Can I give you this? The reconciliation put the trespass in the past. Now, this is oftentimes a challenge for us. We struggle to leave the past in the past, don't we? I've struggled with that. My, one of my, my problems is, uh, one of my blessings in life is I have a good memory. One of my problems in life is I have a good memory, okay? And I remember things I wish I could forget. Every year in January, I remember something I wish I could forget, but I cannot. But when, when they were reconciled, when God reconciled them, the trespass was put into the past. And Adam and Eve's relationship with God had a future from that point on. See, we focus too much on our past relationship issues and not enough on the future of the relationship. So I ask you tonight, are you living in the trespasses of the past or are you making plans for the future of your relationships? See, I was not, and I'll be careful, you know, I made a lot of mistakes when my children were young and I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not confessing to you, I'm not justifying anything, but when my children were young and I, we had first, we had gotten married and we had children and I didn't know. I didn't know how to be a dad. I didn't know what to do. And I wasn't, uh, the first couple of four or five, four years or so, I wasn't serving the Lord anyway. I wasn't doing like I was supposed to be doing. And I made a mess. I made a lot of mistakes. Why well, don't, I try not to live back there. I try every day as best, I, and I, I'm not trying to give glory to me. I'm trying to make a point. I try every day to make today good in my relationships with my children. They're grown. I made a lot of mistakes. I was gone a lot, and I made a lot of mistakes. I can't change that. Uh, to the glory of God, I'm not saying this to, again to, to shine a light on me. But yesterday morning, we traveled here yesterday. 
I got up at 4.30 yesterday morning, I got a little six-year-old grandson wanted to go deer hunting. It was youth day. I have 18 acres, we live in the woods. Behind us is National Forest. And there are some people I thought about burying back there, but anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, so my little grandson and my son come out six o'clock in the morning. And we went hunting before I left to come here to Indiana. I went hunting with my son and my grandson. That's not a big thing. But see, a long time ago, I said, I don't have time for that. I, I'm in the ministry. Now, I, I'm going to say this soon. We're gonna, I'll tell you more about that later. But I'll tell you this. I confess this is sin. Years ago, the Lord was really blessing my ministry. And I was traveling all over the country. And I, here's a thought for you. I'm talking to parents that have young children, okay? There were, and this is what I was living for, there were big name preachers that I wanted them to know who I was. And there's big name preachers back then that knew who I was. But my children did not know me. Did you hear what I said? There was big name preachers knew who I was. Men I could call their names. I preached with them. I preached with Lee Robertson. I preached three times for Tom Malone. I preached with Shelton Smith. I know Shelton Smith. I got a cell phone number. I had Tom Malone's cell phone number. Men that I love and respect, they knew who I was. But my children didn't know me. I can't change that. I don't tell people that very often. I just feel led tonight to do. See, what I, we got to do is realize our relationship has a future. You have a future. If you're breathing air and your children, if they, even if they're grown, are still, are, are still here with you, you have a future with them, a future relationship Young people, if your parents are still living, you have a future with them. The relationship has a future. Can I give you this? I've got to move along quickly here, but can I tell you this? Adam and Eve's relationship had a future after their fall. Notice in chapter 3, verse 20, we read this. And Adam called uh, his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Let me give you this real quick. Up until this point, uh, Eve, her name was woman. Did you know that? Her name was woman. Adam said, you'll be called woman, and I can't quote that right now, because you were taken from me. The word woman has two meanings. One's biological, physical. It means person with womb. That'd help a lot of people in science right there, okay? Amen. <laughs> okay, person with womb. But woman also means part of me. Sir, your wife is part of you. Think about that a minute. That'll help you. Amen. But now he's going to add to that. He said, now your name's going to be Eve because you're going to be the mother of all living. Now watch this. They had messed up. They're being put out of the Garden of Eden. But God still let them produce life. Your relationship, even though there's been a problem in the past, there was trauma. There was a uh, somebody messed up really bad. There can still be a future, and the relationship can still be productive. Now let me give you this. I'm done. I'm gonna watch this. I'm gonna close my Bible. I'm not even gonna look any more in my notes. I got more stuff, but I'm gonna give you this because it'll help you. Okay. <laughs> watch this. My dad. I don't. I just got. I'm careful. Forty years ago, yesterday, my dad died. On October 3rd, we buried him. When I was 10 years old, he made a profession of faith. He died of cancer. He died a very slow, terrible death. And I did my best. My brother and I took turns every other night. I'd go over and spend the night with him, and I'd pick him up out of the bed. And a man that was, uh, was a roofer at one time and was in the Army and served under Patton and I fought World War II, was a decorated World War II veteran, and, and uh, was always 
could flex up the muscles. I mean, he had the muscles. He dwindled down to nothing. I'd pick him up out of bed, put him in a chair, would change his bed sheets, and I'd shave him every other day, clean him up. He could be mean. But he was the only dad I ever had. But because in September 1970, he knelt down on the living room floor and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I do believe, although he struggled with a lot of things, he struggled with his past a lot, I don't think he ever understood grace, what grace did for him. I believe he sincerely asked Christ to be his Savior. And as he was dying, I saw the, how real that was. <laughs> Guess what? I have a future relationship with my dad. I will see him again. He won't be in a hospital bed, and he, he won't be dwindled down to nothing anymore. It'll all be wonderful. It'll all be good. Your relationships have a future. And maybe you're struggling with something right now. Maybe you're, there's a marital issue. Maybe there's a problem with, uh, 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 in your relationship with a child or whatever it might be. You just pray. And you work on forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration because the relationship has a future. Why did the prodigal father, the son's father, hug his neck? He'd spent a fortune. He'd wasted his inheritance. But yet when the son came home, the father ran and fell on his neck. I think he parked to protect him. He was glad he came home and kissed his neck and loved him and hugged him. Why did he do that after the boy had wasted his inheritance? Can I give you this thought? Because the boy Amen. was more valuable than the inheritance he had wasted. Your child, your family member, your spouse is more valuable than any physical possession of wealth that you have. Preacher, you come ahead. Amen. Thank you, Brother John for taking the time to come here and be here. I am not going to clutter the air with a lot of thought after that. But I'm going to just ask this next few to play, and we're just going to have a quiet time. The Lord has spoke to your heart. The altar is open. Make it special.